Good morning and welcome to the 14th meeting of the committee in 2019. Can I remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should ensure that they're turned to silent. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Does the committee agree to take in private item three, which is consideration of correspondence from the Finance and Constitution Committee? Great. Our next item of business is an evidence session on Article 50 Negotiations International Trade. This morning we will take evidence from the Scottish Government Minister for Trade, Investment and Innovation, Ivan McKee, MSP, and Ruben Aitken, the Deputy Director for Trade Policy with the Scottish Government. Uh, good morning and thank you for coming today. Um, can I invite the Minister to give an opening statement? Yes, delighted to. And uh, good morning everyone and thanks for inviting me along this morning. Um, the committee's inquiry into the negotiation of international trade agreements and the implications for Scotland is well timed. You've taken evidence from a number of uh, experts in the field and one message is clear. If the UK is to create an independent trade policy, there is a huge amount to do. Um, it is essential that the devolved administrations and legislatures should play a full part in this work and the voice of Scotland's commercial and trade interests must be heard. The Scottish Government understands the importance of trade to the success of our economy and that is why we are so serious about enhancing and securing Scotland's role in future trade arrangements. We published a discussion paper last year which makes the case for a guaranteed role for the Scottish Government and Parliament in all stages of the formulation, negotiation, agreement and implementation of future trading arrangements. And we are continuing to press this case to ensure that Scotland's economic and social needs are protected and promoted. We are working across government and beyond to identify what matters to the Scottish economy and in particular the key differences between Scotland and the UK which must be taken into account in developing and negotiating trade deals that work to the benefit of the whole of the UK. The scope of modern trade deals is increasingly uh, is increasing and now they typically deal with and merge a range of reserved and devolved policy areas. This is important implications for Scotland and it is right that the voices of our consumers, businesses and others are heard both in terms of what we want to trade and also how we want to trade. Alongside work to ensure a better way of developing future trade arrangements, we are also supporting our businesses now to increase the value of Scotland's international exports. A trading nation, our plan for growing Scotland's exports was published at the National Economic Forum last week and focuses on the actions that will have the greatest impact on Scotland's export performance and our economy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr McKee. And as you indicated at the beginning of your remarks, the committee has, uh, has taken a, a considerable amount of evidence from international trade experts and experts who have uh, experience of actually negotiating uh, trade deals. Um, and what came through very, very strongly uh, was the need for early preparation, um, gathering information and setting the red lines at, at a very early stage um, at every level of government, across government and of course with the wider sectors so that before you actually go into the negotiating room you know exactly uh, what your red lines are and what you're hoping to achieve. Uh, now you, you mentioned your discussion paper and I think the indication in your discussion paper was that you you very much uh, believe that the Scottish Government has to be in there early, but the UK's paper doesn't seem to indicate, it, it says that the role for the devolved administrations, but it doesn't specify you know, that the role should be at that early stage. And I wondered if you could maybe give us more of an indication of where you are with the UK Government in that, whether you have actually been told that no, you can't be in there at an early stage, which is what the experts suggest needs to happen? Yeah, no, you're right, uh, convener. Um, the, uh, the discussion paper we, we produced in um, August 2018 covered that uh, our uh, uh, view on this in, in, in quite a bit of depth um, and really argued that international best practice, and we looked at some examples, was that uh, devolved administrations 
um, should be and Parliament should be involved, not just at the beginning of the negotiation, but even at the stage where you're deciding who you're going to negotiate with. So right from that point, right through pulling together the, uh, the, the drawing up the, uh, the, the the negotiating red lines, if you like, and uh, the, the offensive and defensive positions, um, and then right through the negotiations themselves, through the agreement and the ratification of the agreement at every stage. And if you look, for example, at the way the Canadian provinces have been involved in uh, in, in negotiations. Um, that uh, sets some some good examples to follow. So we think that, uh, that that's the best way forward, um, and it was quite a substantial piece of work. The UK government, as you say, came back with a few paragraphs commenting on it, um, and they recognise that there is a role, but they don't uh, formalise that role or indicate how they would want to take that forward. We are continuing to talk with the UK government, and I meet my counterpart, George Hollenbury, from time to time. Um, behind the scenes, there's work going on on a concordat as to how that process could and should work, um, but that progress on that is kind of stalled at the moment. So I think uh, th there is limited discussion, um, and we're quite away from reaching an agreement on uh, on how this should be handled. We see it as um, it, it's hugely important um, for the future trade negotiations that, that will take place with our party countries, with the EU clearly as well, um, but also with the rollover uh, deals, uh, the, the continuity uh, deals that are ongoing at, uh, at the moment as well, where those will perhaps have some changes in them. And again, we feel that we should be, uh, as and all the other devolved administrations should be involved in that process from an early stage. So in terms of these rollover deals, which we're calling them rollover deals, yeah. but as you know, quite often they differ quite considerably from the, the deals that we already yeah. um, enjoy. But um, what, what should be been your input there? Um, fairly limited, other than we, we periodically get an update on where they are um, in terms of the uh, the process. So that is um, that's not uh, not not great in that sense because, as you say, I mean, I was actually in, in Norway um, at the point where they announced that they'd done the rollover deal with Norway, um, and it was it was it was fairly obvious straight away that the, the, the deal wasn't the same as the, 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 the current uh, deal that we enjoy as EU members um, and that it didn't include services, for example, regulation, a number of other aspects. So um, it, it was flagged as a, or, or presented as being a rollover, but there were significant um, gaps and changes and omissions to what was uh, previously or is currently in place. So um, in that sense, it's important that uh, the devolved administrations are involved, but also in terms of the prioritisation of those those deals, the UK government is going th has gone through a prioritisation process as to which uh, rollover of the 40 plus rollover deals it, it wants to do first. Um, I think nine are now in place, although as I say, some of those are different to what was in place before. Um, but there are others that aren't UK priorities but there are Scottish priorities because we have specific sectoral interests. Some of the North African markets, for example, where um, items like seed potatoes that are important to our, our uh, agricultural sector are, are, are very critical, but those are fairly low down the UK's list of priorities. So in the sense of prioritisation and in terms of the content, it's important that Scotland's involved and we're disappointed at the level of engagement uh, so far. Right, OK. I mean, have, have the UK government point blank refused um, to consider Scotland's early engagement? I mean, you say that you haven't been able to reach agreement, hmm. but have they, have they basically said, no, we, we're not going to include you at the early stage, we're not going to have you help set priorities? I, I think, to be fair, and, and, and there will be discussions <laughs> at official level, so, so Ruben might want to comment as well, but I think, to be fair, when you talk to... Um, Say my counterpart George Hollenbury, um, he understands that uh, it makes sense, I think, for us to be um, involved and certainly makes the right uh, the right noises, if you like, with, in that regard at a, a, a very top level. But when it gets down to the detail of it, it's very stop-start. Go, we go through periods where we get information, then, then it kind of dries up, and then we've got to push again to get more information. Um, and you, you get the feeling it's more of a, um, a box ticking exercise rather than uh, um, rather than DIT being fully engaged and understanding that it's important that, that we are involved. And not just from our point of view, but because it allows the UK to go into those negotiations um, with a much stronger position because the negotiating party understands that they've got buy-in right across the piece and it isn't something that's going to fall apart 
through the negotiations as uh, as fault lines start to start to appear. I don't know if there's any anything you want to add to to that in terms of the uh, communications at official level. Um, so I'd agree uh, wholeheartedly with that. The um, issues that we face is that whilst the narrative is, is often quite good about wanting to involve us in practice, the engagement and the involvement, uh, for instance, on the recent tariff announcements, which will have material impact were it to come to pass, uh, is next to nothing. So um, what's the noises? as the Minister said, a, a, a kind of positive. The, the practice that we're experiencing at the moment uh, is, is less than we would like. Right. Those recent tariff announcements, I take it what you're referring to was the decision to uh, liberalise, basically drop tariffs uh, in certain areas uh, in the event of a no deal. I was, uh, I think the committee were, were quite surprised at some of the areas that uh, had been chosen as them uh, areas to drop tariffs. One of them was in various dairy products, which certainly affects the part of Scotland that I represent in, in the south. Um, were there any other areas um, where these tariffs were dropped where if you had been consulted, you'd have said, no, that's that's bad for Scotland? I think that there's two points on that. First of all, just to touch on the um, our input to that. I mean, I remember that night fairly well because I was out to, uh, at dinner with a group of technology businesses and uh, to leave the dinner to, to take a call at eight o'clock at night. Um, and the call was to let me know that in the morning they would be publishing these tariffs, um, but also to let me know that the, the Prime Minister had just announced that in the House of Commons anyway, so it was public knowledge anyway, and that they couldn't tell me what the tariffs were because it was market sensitive and I would find out uh, when it was announced in the morning. So uh, that that was a level of engagement um, on in terms of the, the, the process. In terms of the specifics, um, I think that uh, we, we've asked for... Uh, the numbers in about the impact assessment, how they've arrived at those uh, those the, the, those tariffs. Clearly, you're balancing the consumer interest with the uh, the producer interest, um, and also uh, maintaining positions for future negotiations. Because if you give away too much at this stage, you've got less in the bag for uh, for negotiation later, which puts you in a weaker place. So it's a multifaceted. Uh, um, uh, 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 situation, but um, as I say, we've been disappointed with the the level of uh, impact assessment that we've seen. Effectively, not nothing, and uh, the under our understanding of the process that they went through to clarify to to, to 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 arrive at the uh, at the tariffs that they have. Um, so yeah, you've you've highlighted on the agricultural side there are there are concerns there because Scotland's clearly got a different a different profile from the rest of the UK in terms of what's important to us. Um, and um, as I say, the uh, we're still waiting really to understand uh, what the number crunching have done to assess the impact of that on the UK and the Scottish economy. And again, I don't know if you want to add anything anything to that. Is just lastly, um, in an ideal world, if, 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 if things changed and you, you did get the early engagement that experts say is needed and, and, and you say is needed, uh, what is the Scottish Government's readiness to pr provide the UK Government with the kind of pertinent information on you know, aggregate and sectoral interests uh, of Scotland? Do you feel that, that, you, that you have the information and the capacity um, to, to make a big difference at an early stage? Yeah, I think we have, and we've um, set up a new directorate within the Scottish Government, which I believe is now up to 70, 70 people. Um, so that's um, looking at um, international trade and investment, so how we drive exports, but also very much focused on trade policy um, as well. So it gives us capacity there to do uh, to do work, to, under to, to engage with businesses in Scotland um, and to do analysis on, um, on where we see the priorities. If you look at our response to the UK government's um, uh, call for consultation on the four um, trade deals that they have started work on, um, which are New Zealand, Australia, the US and the Pacific Partnership, uh, we responded with a fairly substantial document um, on that back in November of last year, which identified for each of those markets what the UK priorities were, what Scotland's priorities were, where the differences were, and the different approaches we would uh, we would like to see with respect to those negotiations. So I think we, we do have the capacity in place. We do have um, 
the, uh, the, the w w we've shown with our response already on those those first four trade deals how we would approach that, um, and the specifics will clearly depend on where the UK goes next with uh, with trade deal negotiations and the environment we're working in with regards to the situation with the EU, whether we're in or out of a customs union, um, and what the priorities are in terms of which markets they're going to uh, they're going to look at first. Okay, thank you very much. I'll now hand over to Claire Baker, MSP. Um, thank you, convener. Um, if I just maybe ask a wee bit more about capacity issues. We had evidence from trade negotiators um, a couple of weeks ago who demonstrated huge experience and expertise in this area, and I think laid out to the committee how complicated um, trade negotiations are. So it's not just about the preparations for gathering information on Scotland and feeding that in. It's actually the, the hard-edged business of trade negotiations. Do you feel that, I don't know if you want to pass any views on the UK government's um, capacity to deal with this. You've referred to issues around tick, spot, tick boxing and lack of um, engagement. I'm not sure if that is maybe tied to some capacity issues. That's maybe been too fair to the government, but given so much else is going on around Brexit. There's, um, but also the Scottish government's understanding and capacity building around how trade negotiations actually work and what the real political story to trade negotiations is. No, you're absolutely right that there is huge complexity around about them and um, it's about lining up your, your offensive position, your defensive position, understanding the wider context um, and how it's going to impact your economy and what cards to play at any particular point in time through that, uh, through that process. Um, clearly the EU has been at that for um, a long time and I think it's fair to say it's developed uh, significant capacity to, to do that, as, as you've seen demonstrated with the negotiations with the, the 40 deals that they've got in, in place at the moment. Um, the UK, by contrast, hasn't done any of that for, for 40 years. Um, and um, I think with the best one in the world, the, the lack of experience would be a, would be a, a challenge. Um, so that is clearly an area of concern in terms of us as part of the UK and then benefiting or, or otherwise from deals that the UK manages to uh, to negotiate. So uh, I think that's a concern and I think within the, the UK environment um, it's clear that the, uh, the that the focus has been very much on preparing for the no deal scenario. So while the whole UK government has been sucked into the Brexit um, environment um, and preparing for Brexit, within the, the trade part of that, it's really been sucked into preparing for, for no deal to the exclusion of, of, of much else. Um, so the focus on the rollover deals has been the priority rather than focusing on on, uh, on, on new trade deals. And I think that also talks to a, a capacity challenge um, at that level. In terms of, from a Scottish perspective, clearly it's the UK that would be leading the negotiations. Um, and our part in that would be to flag up issues that were of concern to Scotland in advance and to make sure that those were included in the uh, in the UK's negotiating mandate. So it's a different ask, if you like, in terms of what we're putting on the table. We wouldn't be uh, uh, leading those negotiations, although um, we have, what we have argued for is for Scotland's concerns to be taken on board as part of the putting together of the UK's initial negotiation position, and for Scotland to be involved in that process as the as the negotiations developed. So we can be one step back from the front line on that, if you like. Um, so it's a different ask, as I say, um, and uh, we've got to, so we've put the capacity in place. And we will see how that uh, how that moves forward. But a, a large part of that is going to be clearly our engagement with uh, sectoral bodies and businesses throughout Scotland to understand what's important to them as we approach each negotiation, and obviously with the Parliament as well. Uh, you mentioned uh, Concordat being developed. I think you said that was around how the process would operate, how the two governments would cooperate on. I suppose I'm interested in. You've st I understand the proposal you've put forward from the Scottish Government about early stage involvement and knowing and being involved in the process as it goes on. What we heard from trade negotiators is, also you go in with offensive and defensive and you have red lines, and, but when it comes down to having to make a deal, there are trade-offs involved in that. Um, and you, you've indicated that the UK Government would be the negotiating team. 
I suppose it's how far you think the Scottish Government should be involved in those final stages and how that process might operate and will the Concordat address these issues? Do you think there's a role for devolved administrations at that level or is there a recognition? The other thing they talked about the trade negotiators was the importance of trust um, between the key negotiators and how that operates within the UK's uh, political context. Yes, um, and it's important to recognise it's not just Scotland, it's all of the devolved administrations um, uh, involvement in that uh, um, in that process. Um, yeah, you're right that uh, the, 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 the detail round about that as you get to the, the, the business end of the negotiation, if you like, when um, the uh, trade-offs have to be made um, is a crucial part um, and the, uh, the the position of Scottish interests need to be protected at that point. So that was why we argue for involvement from the very early stages of the process right through to the, the final stages of the negotiation and then the ratification of uh, of any agreements. Um, because when it gets to that, uh, that hard-nosed part at the end, towards the end of the process, it's important that uh, our interests are, are represented and heard there. Um, as I said earlier, the, the, the discussion paper identifies some international um, practice in there that, that we think it's instructive to learn from Canada, Belgium and others uh, where the, 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 the sub-national um, administrations are involved to some degree in the process. Um, so th there are models out there that we can we can look at and learn from that work, uh, work well. Um, and I think you're right about the trust aspect because um, it's important that everybody is lined up behind the single negotiating position, understands the trade-offs and is able to have those discussions um, in parallel, if you like, in the back room as that process is, is ongoing. Um, and that's how I think you build the trust, because if you're doing it in isolation and not involved in the wider, uh, the, 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 the wider interests, uh, the involved administrations and so on, then you end up perhaps in a weaker position whereby you don't have buy-in right across the piece for what you're, uh, what you're negotiating. And I think that is something that is more problematic. I think that uh, the parties you're negotiating with recognise that. The, the EU, for example, was very keen that the Canadian provinces were in the room um, and were part of the, uh, the, the the process of negotiating the trade deal with Canada. So I think that's recognised that that is the kind of mature, grown-up um, way to do it. Uh, it's the way that gets the best results and it's the way that builds the most trust in the process. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Jamie Green. Thank you, uh, convener. Good, good morning, gentlemen. Um, I, I, I take on board what you're saying. Great interest. I think that's you make some very valid points. That if all the uh, negotiators in the room are singing from the same hymn sheet, it makes the negotiation much more powerful. Uh, I think that's a, a commendable approach. Um, and and you, it's interesting you mentioned the Canada deal. I mean, the reality of that deal is you could argue the obverse, and that's indeed that it, it, it took so long and suffered so many problems because of the. Uh, vested interests of each constituent part of the block that was negotiating. It was very famously, uh, you know, Wallonia refused to give Belgium's authorisation to ratify the deal. Um, I'm sure, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that the Canadian provinces did not have that issue. But m my question is therefore, what happens in that scenario when you have a, uh, a single negotiating uh, body that is made up of constituent parts with their own rightfully so vested interests? or indeed different political views on, on, on the world. TTIP and CETA were very controversial uh, politically for many. What happens if you get to that stage where the, the, the members, the, in this our case of devolved administrations, cannot agree a single unified position to go into that negotiating room? That puts us in a very sticky position. Well, as you say, I think it's how you approach that and the, uh, <coughs> the intent that's there. Um, and certainly, the intent is if we're in that position where we're outside the EU and hopefully we won't be, but if we do end up in that position where we're having to negotiate these uh, uh, trade deals, then the intent would be that you've got to get the best deal for the whole of the UK um, and Scottish interests need to be protected in that. So there's clearly going to be areas of disagreement and areas of different priorities um, and those just need to be worked through and that's part of the negotiating process. I mean, the EU does it, they've got 27 uh, countries that they bring to the table, but they've got a very well-developed process, uh, and the range of different 
objectives there can be, can be very wide, clearly, given the, the range of different uh, countries that are involved in that. But they've got a very uh, mature process where they go through and identify what the negotiating uh, stances are, and that's all published, and it, so everybody can see what it is, um, and then they move forward from there. Um, so the fact that you've got lots of parties involved can actually give you strength. I mean, I think it would probably be true to say that if you look at the EU negotiations on, on Brexit, that it's the EU that's had the most uh, the most stable and, and, and clear positions, despite the fact that they brought 27 parties together at the table, and it's the UK that's been the party, despite there only being Westminster, that hasn't had clarity on on what they're looking for. So just because you've got lots of parties there doesn't mean you're going to have a more uh, a more confused position. And in fact, I think it's been demonstrated it can often be quite the opposite. Th thank you for that. That's, that's very helpful. Um, I think in an ideal world that is the case. And I think you're right, you've put, hit the nail on the head, is that if there's an established protocol uh, by which uh, a dispute resolution within a, a negotiating block can be achieved, that's very helpful. Um, but, uh, you know, this comes up time after time. Uh, Italy's another great example of... Um, sticking its its boot in uh, when it feels appropriate, but again, these are these are things that are altered by the political shifts in their own domestic landscapes. The Five Star Movement, for example, have, have a strategy in that respect. They've tried to put their uh, block on the Australia uh, uh, trade deal, for example. So these things, even within the EU, still can and do happen. Um, can I ask an, a separate question, and that's around uh, the nature of uh, you know, for your own views on the nature of these types of bilateral deals um, a year after CETA was introduced we've had the opportunity to analyze the success or otherwise of it what we're actually seeing is that imports from the EU into Canada are massively on the increase but exports from Canada into the EU are not uh, many Canadian businesses for example are, are suffering with the flooding of of their country with zero tariff goods uh, and that's a concern to their domestic markets how do you uh, think that would affect us here as we start to do these uh, bilateral deals and how do we protect Scottish interests thereof? Well, I think that, um, I'm not aware of that, 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 that evidence you're, you're talking about, but that's interesting if that is the case, that would on the surface point to the EU having negotiated a better deal. Um, and I think it talks to the importance of having um, very clear and well understood um, negotiating position um, and the strength of that and the buy-in across um, all parties for what you're what you're trying to achieve, um, and it talks to the difficulty going back to the issue before the fact that the UK hasn't done this for forty years, and um, it's not um, as easy as some would make you believe that you just rock up and uh, do a bit of negotiation and sign a deal and everything's great. You need to really understand very clearly the implications of what's happening um, and understand what uh, what the risks and opportunities are and how best to leverage those through the negotiation. So it is um, it's a process that takes a long time um, because of the complexity of it and it's a process where, as I say, you really need to understand very well what the, the implications of, of it are um, on your consumers and on your businesses. I think my question, however, to be just to zoom in a little bit in, in Scotland is, is that clearly uh, different parts of the UK will have different markets and strengths. You know, there will be a, a, a seafood industry that's stronger in one region than another. But indeed, there may be shared interests. So if you look at Whitby, Cornwall and Aberdeenshire, they may have a shared and common goal to negotiate certain positions. Uh, the dairy industry is stronger in some areas, but not in others, for example. So how, how do you balance that or how would you approach that if you were in that room and around that table, uh, balancing the needs of protecting what you think are, are Scotland's uh, trading interests with uh, being cognisant of uh, and respectful of the interests of other devolved uh, parts of the UK? Well, I, I think at, at that level, it's, it's, it's understanding clearly what where our interests are, and you've highlighted some of them there. And as I say, we've, we've put the capacity in place in the Scottish Government so as we understand that better and are able to articulate that better. And then it's having those discussions around about where the upsides and the downsides are um, and putting forward the, the arguments and the evidence that, that, that highlights why certain parts of the UK would suffer or benefit based on um, based on what, what we're going to do. Now, clearly, obviously, it depends on 
um, who you're negotiating with on the on the, the other side and, and what their asks are likely to be because depending on who it is, they're going to have different priorities themselves um, and understanding how best to play that. But I think taking on board the expertise and understanding that the Scottish Government would have in engagement with sectors in Scotland has got to bring value and strength to a UK negotiating position. Thank you. That's very helpful. Stuart McMillan. Well, uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Uh, just a, a couple of questions. Um, at the, towards the, well, the end of the process, uh, when uh, treaties are going to be uh, concluded, um, what, uh, what type of uh, activity would the Scottish Government actually be looking for to actually monitor uh, the impact of uh, any trade deals uh, that, that would be undertaken? Yeah, well, and first of all, I say that obviously this is new to us all, so it's um, the, uh, the the specifics of how that looks. Uh, I say the process is new, and also the discussions with the UK government as to how exactly that's going to work, as we've discussed, uh, are new as well. But I think at that stage, as, you, as, you, as you're moving the, through the whole process, I think from the very beginning, you, you need to understand um, the strengths of your own sector and where the risks and the opportunities are and do some analysis on that. And I say that's something we're putting in capacity to do so that as you get through that process, you're able to present the data and say, um, yeah, this is how the impact's going to gonna, gonna affect Scottish uh, Scottish producers and uh, what um, we think the, uh, the risks are there in any given scenario. So I think, as I say, it's about having that information, having that data, that analysis, the impact assessment to hand so that you can do that, share, compare notes with what the data the UK government may have on various uh, sectors so that we reach something that, um, that allows us to have the, the, the strongest uh, negotiating position. I mean, I mean, on that, um, have you had any discussions with uh, the UK government on that type of activity thus far, or, or is that something you would uh, approach uh, closer to the time? Well, I think at the, the moment we're keen to talk on all of this as much as we can, um, and uh, the, the discussion paper talks to all stages of the process. Um, so the, the, the issues I've said is, is, if you like, bringing the UK government to the table to talk to us about the pulling together the Concordat and the understanding at each stage of that process what um, what that engagement looks like and the, the mechanisms whereby ourselves and the Parliament um, the, the Parliaments because the, the UK Parliament has, has got a role in this as well which is which is need, uh, in our view um, needing to be uh, to be enhanced and the Scottish Parliament and other devolved administrations um, how that engagement takes place. And in terms of that aspect of the, the engagement with uh, the Scottish Parliament, uh, we have some of discussions uh, around the secondary legislation uh, in the Delegated Personal Law Reform Committee. Uh, we had actually a session about that on Tuesday. Um, but in terms of uh, trade negotiations, uh, what is the process going to be uh, from the, between the Scottish Government and uh, the Scottish Parliament in terms of uh, informing the Parliament and keeping the Parliament fully uh, up to date in terms of uh, how the trade negotiations uh, are developing? Well, our, uh, our approach to that is very much that we would want to engage, involve, consult as much as possible because we think that brings strength to the process. Um, and we, uh, the government is, 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 is very happy to um, provide information to committees and to the parliament and to appear in front of committees and talk through and give regular updates. I think the only caveat on that would be there may be scenarios at various stages where there's, there's confidential information that the UK government might not want to be shared more widely and publicly. Um, but uh, outside of that, to say we're very keen to, uh, to engage um, with, with the parliament and with the uh, wider sexual interests across Scotland. So, so very keen then to uh, to attend committees, uh, relevant committees where possible, uh, and notwithstanding the fact that there may well be occasions where it may have to be a private meeting as compared to uh, a public session. Yes, within those constraints, um, yeah, and I'm always uh, um, delighted to appear in front of your committee. Okay. No, so that's okay. a quick supplementary, because sure. I asked the First Minister about this when she came before the Parliament's Conveners Group yesterday, and she said she envisaged a very formal role for the Scottish Parliament in, the, in scrutiny of trade negotiations. And you'll know that the Trade Committee of the European Parliament has a very formal role. Are you able to expand on, on what that formal role would look like? Uh, I don't have any 
more specifics on that. Sorry. No. I don't know if you're on that. No, <clears throat> no, beyond what we set out in the, the discussion paper for, for saying that we, we want to make this as transparent a process as possible because we believe that's a better way to get more societal engagement and better outcomes for Scottish consumers and producers. Um, but we'd be really key, keen to hear any recommendations for the sort of engagement that would be most effective from, from parliamentarians, from committees, from parliament yes. itself. I'm sure the committee would be very happy to do that at the end of our inquiry. Thank you very much. Um, Sorry, Mr McMillan, sorry, I didn't realise you weren't, no. weren't finished. Thank you. Uh, and just a, one, a brief question. That you mentioned earlier, uh, Minister, you used the words uh, uh, trust issues and intent and the e EU having a, a mature process, uh, amongst other comments. Uh, you also uh, highlighted that the Concordat is currently being developed. Um, do you see that the trust and the intent and the mature process uh, being undertaken from the UK government towards the Scottish government and the other devolved administrations? I think it would be fair to say that um, we, we certainly think it could be much better in those regards than it has been to date. And I think that is probably a combination of the capacity issues we talked about before at the UK government's end, uh, the, 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 the lack of experience they have in the trade negotiations, but also, frankly, the, the, the fact that um, the Westminster system is set up to... Uh, um, by and large be focused on what the UK government's priorities are without taking into account necessarily wider, uh, wider concerns, be that from the devolved administrations or indeed from, from the UK Parliament. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Minister, we've already touched this morning about the need to enhance and protect uh, the trade that we have. Now, we're well aware, and you are too, that, that Scotland has world-leading goods and services, uh, and our, our, our status uh, in that requires to be secured. Uh, so can I ask, when you're looking at, uh, the Scottish Government are looking at ways of selecting uh, trade partners for future negotiations, uh, where, what stage are you at and which countries are you considering or looking at to, in, to enhance that ability to ensure that we can protect and enhance those goods and services? Cool. Um, yeah, if, if only it was up to us <laughs> to make those decisions, but I'm afraid it isn't yet. Um, the, uh, clearly there's a number of different scenarios playing there. I've mentioned the, 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 the rollover agreements and the prioritisation within that, and we've clearly articulated to the, uh, the UK government um, where we have specific sexual interests. I, I mentioned some of the North African countries, etc., where we've got agricultural requirements, etc. So there are specifics there. Um, and with regard to the four, um, nego uh, four uh, potential new trade deals that the UK government has identified, uh, New Zealand, Australia, the US and the... Uh, Trans-Pacific, we've commented on those at length because we see um, we're not sure that New Zealand is very small. Trans-Pacific isn't yet established, so you're coming in at a very um, early and embryonic stage there. And with the US, while it is our largest market, um, the, uh, the, the, the the opportunities and the challenges round about a trade deal with the US are, are, are many uh, for various reasons. Um, so those are um, uh, we've commented on 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 the prioritisation with regards to those. Clearly, the European Union is our biggest trading partner by far, and um, as I've indicated already, the Scottish Government's position is that we should stay in the EU, or as a minimum, we, we should stay in the customs union and the single market, whereby we wouldn't be needing to go through this whole trade negotiation process anyway. Um, so uh, if, if neither of those come to pass, then we would be negotiating a trade deal with the EU, and to our mind, that is the priority. I mean, we've done our export uh, plan analysis of the um, of the, the top 15 countries, almost all of them are in the, the EU. Um, so we see that as a, as the clear priority for Scotland's interests and the UK's interests for securing a trade deal going forward. And 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 you've identified that that, that there are a number of countries across the EU that that you would prioritise uh, and ensure that 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 negotiation and trade was going back and forward. Uh, but. 
we are where we are with the negotiations at present. Uh, none of us want to be in this stage because we want to ensure that business and commerce is given that stability, uh, that they know what's happening for their continuity, uh, and, and many have gone into uh, ensuring that they have some kind of contingency plans in place. Uh, but as we continue this process, uh, what do the Scottish Government see as their role in ensuring that continuity, that continuation, uh, and that stability is still there? Well, if you're talking about stability through the Brexit process, then um, I think what the UK government, the way they've handled that is, is usually problematic. And I hear from businesses almost on a daily basis about the, across a whole range of sectors about the challenges that that causes for them. So the position we're in is, is, is uh, it was hard to imagine it could get worse, but it probably has because we're now in a position where we don't even know what we don't know because nobody knows what's going to happen when or not. Um, and uh, if, if you're trying to run a business in that environment, it's, it, it's hugely complex and um, very costly and uh, and, uh, and, and very problematic. So, given the, the chaos of the, the, the Brexit situation, then um, I think from our point of view, it's, uh, it's about supporting businesses to, uh, um, to be able to, uh, to, to, to deal with, uh, with those challenges um, and try and, as best they can, anticipate what, what may or may not happen. Um, and to, in terms of the, the trade deals we're talking about, to move forward on the, the rollover. Uh, which has got quite a long ways to go yet. There's only nine um, of those um, agreements have been have been put in place, and many of those only partially out of the forty odds that, 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 that exist. So that process needs to be needs to be moved forward with pace. So, and the negotiations that we are, we're having at present about the tariffs and the and the supplies that are taking place has the Scottish government itself uh, considered dropping any tariffs that would have a, an impact on or, 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 the, or the process for the businesses that we're looking forward to support. Well, again, it's not up to us to, to, no, to drop but, tariffs, but... Um, but what, the, is the, uh, what role has the Scottish yeah. Government got in that process? Well, as I said, none. Um, the, the UK Government has decided what it's going to do. They've, uh, they didn't in, in consult us or uh, inform us, and uh, they just pushed ahead with what they did. And our perspective on that is that the amount of analysis and impact assessment they've done on that has been minimal at best. So it is a concern for us, um, and there are risks that... Um, it could, uh, in certain sectors, perhaps mm -hmm. uh, open up um, our, uh, um, our producers to some uh, some challenges, um, and also um, in terms of new trade negotiations going forward, put us in a position where we've got less negotiating capital to uh, to deploy through that those processes. I don't know if you want to comment any more on. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Camille. Yes, um, Tavish Scott. Thank you, Camilla. Um, I wonder, uh, Minister, if you'd be uh, prepared to concede that uh, trade deals, we talk up trade deals, but they have their limitations. Bombardier have just announced the closure of, of their operation in Northern Ireland, no matter the Canada-EU trade deal. So um, would you accept that um, for business, these are trade deals that are important, yes, but they're not the be-all and end-all of the bottom line of any business? No, absolutely. Um, and businesses will trade with businesses in the most difficult and complex of environments because that's what uh, that's what they do. Um, and uh, it's a, an important point. Um, at the end of the day, it's businesses that, uh, that trade and export and they will continue to do so. The job of government, in, in our view, is to make that process as uh, easily and supportive as possible. Um, the export plan that we uh, we, we released uh, published last week um, talks about the, uh, the the Brexit scenario and uh, the, the the trade deal scenario there, but but only very briefly in the terms of context because it does recognise that firstly it's businesses that export and there is a huge amount of work that government can do. Um, notwithstanding any trade deals that are or aren't in place to support businesses to export by providing information, advice, support, connections, networks and, uh, and, and focus um, across a range of, uh, range of opportunities. So it's, it's very clear that, that is, it, 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 what you're saying is exactly right. Um, the trade deals kind of create, help create an environment where trading can be made easier or more difficult if you get it wrong. Um, and uh, they're only one kind of layer in that, that whole process. No, thank you for that. I agree with that. Um, just related to that, um, do you think uh, it is important as to whether a business operating out of Scotland is foreign-owned or domestically-owned? The two obvious examples of food 
to drink are both the whiskey industry and the salmon farming industry, which are predominantly foreign owned, but they are very much part of our Scotland's food export uh, business. Does it matter? Um, I think it very much depends on a case-by-case -case basis, and we've all seen examples of both. I mean, I worked and lived through Silicon Glen, which was problematic because so much of that was um, was uh, satellite plants um, of, uh, of foreign-owned uh, corporations that then, um, for various reasons, moved those elsewhere. Um, but I also regularly meet businesses who were Scottish-owned and, for various reasons, are now part of larger groups. I met one only... Uh, only earlier this week in Glasgow, um, and uh, the, the fact that they're now plugged into um, uh, international businesses that have got a wider perspective, access to more markets, access to more technology, access to more investment, has allowed those businesses to go from strength to strength. The business I saw in Glasgow has trebled in size since, it's, uh, since it was uh, taken over by um, by a foreign, uh, foreign group. So I think it really depends on the intent of who the owners are, and what they uh, what they bring to the party, if you like, um, foreign direct investment is something that we actively push with uh, within the Scottish government and our agencies because we see it brings great value to the Scottish economy. And I think that a big part of what we can do is to ensure that we've got deep roots so that the businesses that are there, that foreign corporation may want to acquire, they're acquiring for the technology, the links to academic institutions, um, the, the skills and talents of the people, or perhaps the natural resources that are inherent to that product or process. And I think having those uh, those deep roots means you've got businesses that, um, regardless of their ownership, are, are going to stay in Scotland. Okay. Um, d just related to your point about your agencies, do I gather from your published documents that you have plans for, or are thinking of plans for Scottish Development International in the context of what you've discussed this morning? And could you lay those out for the committee? Yeah, well, I think, uh, as we talked about, the um, the role of SDI is not largely going to be on the trade policy side. It's going to continue on the, the uh, supporting businesses um, and all the ways I've, I've outlined and, and, and the ways that are in, in the uh, the plan. Um, so that will, will continue. We, we obviously doubled the SDI uh, resource in, um, in Europe over the last three years. And we've got plans, an export plan to um, to continue to add, probably particularly in market specialists um, and key target markets in, in our key target sectors to give us more more depth and uh, and connections. Because at the end of the day, what uh, businesses want to see is um, they they want to have opportunities highlighted to them, and they want to understand the market uh, they're going into a bit better and have connections and networks that they can rely on. So those, I think, are the areas that the SDI is focused on. The trade policy aspect of that is much more within Ruben's team and the uh, and the Scottish Government Directorate. Okay, thank you for that. Last question, if I may, um, convener, is uh, actually something that Tony Mackay's briefing paper that I know that was sent yes. to your um, office, yeah. um, uh, which was, I thought was a courteous thing to do, give you a fair chance of that one too. But I thought the point he made, which was interesting, was the import substitution point. Hmm. Um, do you want to just comment on that? Yeah. Um, that was a, it was a, an observation about which I had not thought about in the mm -hmm. context of facts, figures, data that would support either his contention we're not doing enough or disprove that contention. Yeah. So what's your take? Uh, well, I think it's... Um, uh, I'm surprised he, he didn't find that because if he'd uh, if he'd uh, if he'd done a find and looked for imports, he would have found that in Section Seven, import substitution is mentioned, um, and uh, we, we mentioned import substitution in the context of identifying that as outside the scope because clearly you have to draw a box on what you're going to focus on and to get the depth of analysis we've done we focus very much on driving exports um, but we do recognise that import substitution is an issue and that uh, it's something that's highlighted in Section 8 as something we, we would look to follow up in both in the context of the wider aspects of, uh, of import uh, substitution but also um, in terms of what you might call the quality of exports. So what I mean by that is there are exports where um, a large part of the value added is within Scotland mm -hmm. um, and uh, those clearly add more to the economy than um, uh, exports where um, the, uh, a large part of, uh, of what they're doing is importing something, adding something small to it right. and then, then exporting again. So we understand that and we flagged up that through uh, the next phase of the export plan we're going to be doing some uh, more deep dives in subsectors where to, to understand the value proposition there. And, and one of the other points that was raised in uh, Mr Mackay's uh, 
uh, commentary was round about the, uh, the trade deficit. Um, that is covered also in the export plan and contrary to what he asserted, the data is clear Scotland uh, has uh, and it does and has consistently run a trade surplus in contrast to the rest of the UK that hasn't done so for for quite some considerable time now. So in that sense, Scotland is uh, is better placed um, than the rest of the UK. Surplus with who? International international trade. Yeah, so so Scotland's uh, not not uh, uh, internationally. Um, so Scotland's international exports yeah. are um, uh, higher than our international but imports. That would be fundamentally whisky and salmon farming. I think. Well, it's a whole range of things. I mean, the, the oil and gas services, oil and gas itself are part of that. Um, different technologies, there, there's quite a range. Um, advanced manufacturing, so there's quite a range of... Okay. of, of Thank there. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you. Convener, good morning, Minister. Thank you for coming to see us. Uh, we've had a very interesting discussion, just pick, picking up on a few points, really, at this stage. Uh, Tavish Scott mentioned the importance of the salmon industry uh, and uh, of course in, in my constituency of Cowton Beath Resyth has Maui with some 600 jobs uh, in salmon processing so it's something I'm very well aware of and, and in that regard the point that you made Minister about the, the role of government which uh, you know in terms of business will trade with business but what they look to for governments to do is not to facilitate the imposition of additional burdens surely and I'm sure everybody is watching very carefully uh, in Recyth and elsewhere uh, about that. But picking up, um, so we, we got uh, on some threads earlier, we got a, a copy of the excellent Scotland's role in the development of future UK trade arrangements report in our committee papers this morning. I see that's dated August 2018. I've been hearing what you've been saying about discussions sort of ongoing on a, a stop-start basis, but I'm very surprised. Is there any formal response to this paper from the UK government? I mean, that's um, some eight months ago. Uh, no, there's nothing formal response to the paper, but there were some, as I said, paragraphs in the uh, the UK government's paper that came out in uh, the last few weeks that uh, that mentions devolved administrations and how they see their role. I don't know if you want to comment any more on that, Ruben. <coughs> so as a, a formal response to the discussion paper, this is absolutely right, there, there hasn't been. In, in the February 2019 uh, command paper, processes for making free trade agreements after the UK has left the EU, there were, I think, about six paragraphs relating to devolved administrations' involvement um, with uh, a lot pointing to future work that still needs to happen, uh, and that relates to, as the Minister was pointing out, the, the concordat uh, and hopefully formalising uh, a role for devolved administrations, legislatures um, uh, and others, uh, the kind of wider industry interests to be involved in, in the, the nitty-gritty of, of developing good trade mandates and being involved in the negotiation uh, part as well. Okay, that, that's helpful. Thank you for that further clarification. I mean, obviously, in, in the relevant sections on, on process issues in the government, Scottish government's paper, I mean, there's very detailed proposals put forward about a workable arrangement, and it's very disappointing. It seems that the UK's response to that has been six paragraphs, not really probably addressing the, the detail, because it's the detail that we need to, to sort out. I mean, in terms of the timing of the Concordat, I mean, it is still the case, sadly, that we could see a no-deal scenario, uh, you know, at the drop of a hat, because we have no idea what's going on at Westminster. So, what is the timing of the Concordat? Because it could be that we, you know, I, and it's not something I want to see, and I know the Minister doesn't, but we could see this having to kick off quite soon. So what is the UK government's intention timing-wise? To, to yeah, yeah I mean, it is very disappointing that the UK government hasn't seen fit to move forward with uh, getting the Concordat in place and, and, and discussing that with us. Um, we're disappointed in that. Um, we've clearly been through, well, I've lost count, two cliff edges, narrowly averted so far, and uh, who knows, as you say, what's, uh, what's round the corner. So this could be um, uh, quite a significant issue, depending on how things play out or not uh, over the coming coming period. So, yeah, absolutely, we're, we're disappointed. We would like to have seen further progress, and we urge the UK government to, uh, to move forward um, and engage more um, uh, seriously with us on these matters. Okay, I'm um, turning to another issue that has been raised, an important issue of respect, and I was very uh, appalled really to hear, uh, although perhaps not surprised to hear the Minister say at the outset of his remarks in, in terms of the tariffs, the sort of free-for-all tariffs that were set for many sectors, um, that the first the Minister knew of it was after the Prime Minister uh, had announced it. 
I don't think that shows very much respect, no notification, no prior discussion. I don't see any respect in that. And, and bearing that in mind, I mean, how, in the end of the day, you know, there's great proposals from the Scottish Government, practical proposals, um, say some concordat is bashed out uh, along uh, some of the lines of that, but I suspect it won't take on board uh, much of what has been suggested. How can we seek to ensure in the current constitutional setup that Scotland's interests can be protected in uh, subsequent trade negotiations? And how can we ensure that they're not simply traded away or indeed ignored by the UK government, given the, the situation that we're currently operating? Does the Minister have any thoughts on well, that? Well, I think you're absolutely right round about that risk of these... Um uh, the, the, the Scottish sexual interest being potentially traded away when you get into the, the heat of battle, if you like, towards the end of a, uh, an international trade negotiation. Um, and fisheries is an obvious one that, 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 that springs to mind where uh, you could see that, that scenario evolving um, and, uh, and many other sectors potentially as well. And I think it goes back to what we talked about earlier, building up that trust so that the different parties on the UK side um, are, uh, are comfortable and familiar with where, where things are going and how they're, how they're developing is, uh, is hugely important. And I think that process clearly takes time and the sooner we, uh, we start on that, the better, um, and getting in place the building blocks, for example, the Concord that is therefore doubly important, not just because it lays down the uh, the, the process, but also because it builds the, the, the communication channels and the trust to a deeper level that uh, is important for the whole of the UK, um, and uh, including Scotland's interests in any future trade negotiation. I thank the Minister for that. I mean, I would obviously argue that uh, a very a simple way to ensure that our interests are always protected, first and foremost, in trade negotiations, is to negotiate uh, ourselves. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, Kenneth Gibson. Well, you won't be surprised to know that I support what uh, my colleague Annabel Young has just actually said. But um, um, it seems, from what we've heard today, it's really a question of um, you know Westminster uh, knows best, although we know it doesn't, and uh, Scotland and the outside looking in. Is that a fair assessment of where we are with these? negotiations? I think that would be a fair assessment, yeah. I mean, f from my mind, um, I I've spoken to a number of businesses in, in my constituency over the years who've, who are kind of um, doing okay, but could do better, if you know what I mean. And one of the ways they could do better is if they actually entered the export market. So I'm talking about not particularly small companies here, I'm talking about fairly large companies with a significant number of em employees and are doing well within the UK. But they're fairly deterred from actually exporting and have been in recent years, um, perhaps for a number of reasons. But the, um, how likely is it that uh, these discussions that we're having now are going to uh, encourage people actually to export or will have the opposite effect and prevent companies from growing in, uh, and uh, exporting? Well, I think that uh, that backdrop and that messaging is uh, is important. And if businesses see barriers going up and they see uncertainty and lack of clarity and trade negotiation processes that can go on for years, then clearly, um, I mean, notwithstanding the, the conversation with uh, Tavish Scott earlier about about that isn't trade deals aren't the be all and end all, but clearly it does send set a message and a backdrop and an environment that makes it less likely rather than more likely that those businesses would would export. Um, and I think on another point, it, it, it's interesting that uh, you, you talk about those kind of businesses. If you look at the export plan, those businesses are kind of what I would call their, their kind of tier three, their businesses that are big enough to export um, but haven't done so yet. And we see uh, that layer as being hugely important in our efforts to drive up Scottish uh, exports. And I'd be interested if there's any potential businesses you'd like me to come and meet in this constituency to, uh, to understand better from them. Um, how they see the challenges and what government can do to, to help them. I, I certainly would be more than happy yeah. to do that. Something you want in mind. But touching on a sector that, that uh, has already been mentioned, which is salmon, in, in uh, paragraph 36 of your discussion document, you say that in 2017, 92,000 tonnes of fresh Atlantic salmon worth £600 million was exported from the UK, of which 99% was Scottish, representing a 35% interest in value. Um, 
and 26% increase in volume over the year. So clearly we've got some vibrant sectors that are growing quite significantly. And I should say I've got a constituency interest. Um, uh, W&J Knox in Colburnie, which was founded in 1778 and employs 130 people, actually backs onto my house. And I'll, despite it being in Colburnie, it actually cleans all the the salmon nets for all the fish farms across Scotland. So, um, you know, there are a number of areas where people don't automatically think of employment being in some of these sectors. So how will our, how will our international competitiveness be affected in such areas such as salmon, for example, if, if sectors like this are not prioritised the way they, they should be? Because if it's 99% Scottish and 1% rest of the UK, it may not be given the same priority. I, I think that's absolutely true. And I think that sector, that whole aquaculture sector, is, is interesting. Um, we, we, we talked earlier, Annabelle Ewan talked about Maui and the constituency. And um, clearly they do the, the farming on the, the west coast and further north. But they do have the, the large facility in Recife. And I met with them when I was in... Uh, Oslo um, a couple of months ago along with other um, investors in aquaculture in, uh, in Scotland um, and when you look at where Norway is in this sector and what they've done with it and where Scotland is it's an area we've identified as having the potential to add significant uh, numbers onto our, our export uh, statistics and something we, we focus very much on but the, uh, the risk there as you correctly identified of um, the uh, uncertain times we're in and where trade negotiations may go puts a lot of that uh, growth potential at risk, which is uh, which is very unfortunate because, as you, as you rightly also identify, it's something that isn't just in the areas you would expect it. Scotland does have, I am told by the Norwegians, the best waters in the world for salmon farms because of the, the temperature that we have. Um, and Shelton in particular was identified as, uh, as, as the best of the best. Um, so uh, we do have huge potential there, um, but not just in those areas as you identify, there are businesses in the supply chain right across, right across Scotland. And can we just one other area if I can touch on it. export markets? I mean, you talked about the importance of the EU, and we know it's forty three percent of exports, but the USA is sixteen point one percent. So, as a an, a country, it has the is the largest export market. I'm I'm interested in in what the Scottish government is looking to do to see whether or not we can continue to to grow that. Again, we know there are there are <coughs> issues. I wouldn't touch on the kind of um, the, the the kind of cliches that we hear in the media all the time, but specific um, type of poultry, shall we say? Uh, but um, how does this? What is the Scottish government doing to to preserve its uh, links with that specific market, given the the, the, the scale of it? No, absolutely right. It's um, it's it's number one in our current exports, and we see huge growth potential there as well. But it, but it, it is an interesting uh, one because. Um, a lot of that, it comes back to the point we made earlier, businesses will, will trade their, um, in the current in, uh, trading environment and the trade deal may add some value in some aspects, but it's not the be all and end all in terms of businesses continuing to trade and grow. It's very much a focus for SDI, it's very much a focus for myself. I will be uh, visiting the, the US market later this year to see firsthand what we're doing there and what we can do to continue to focus and grow in that market. But we're, uh, we've are we got a presence, SDI's got a presence um, across a number of, uh, of states in the US focused on different sectors and uh, be it on oil and gas in, in, in Houston, be it on technology in Boston or in, uh, in Silicon Valley um, and uh, across another, a whole range of other um, uh, states within, within the US. But we see great opportunity there and it's something we're very keen on continuing to build those links uh, well, to increase exports. But what's interesting as well, Minister, is that the United States and our second biggest export market, the Netherlands, are traditionally the two biggest inward investment partners that we have. Yes. How is this scenario affecting inward investment? I mean, over the recent years, Ernest and Young have produced uh, annual figures which show that outside London and the South East Scotland has attracted the, 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 the third biggest of the 12 UK regions and nations uh, in terms of uh, inward investment, you know, jobs, new companies, etc. How is the, um, the current scenario affecting uh, that? It's not helpful um, because businesses <coughs> look at that and they have to make some decisions 
on what uh, where to make their investments internationally and the uncertainty around about Brexit. It's hit the whole of the UK, um, which I think it's, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, the data showing that, uh, that, 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 there's, uh, that there's been an impact there and that, of course, impacts Scotland. So there's the impact on the whole UK environment. Um, Scotland's position within that um, is, uh, see, we work very hard, as you rightly identified, to, to be at the top of that tree and uh, we've, we've done we've done well there and we continue to push that and on R&D investment we're actually right at the top of that tree ahead of any other part of the UK in the last year so that's a uh, that's a great success but uh, the Brexit environment is making that difficult because that uncertainty is uh, is hard for businesses to factor in to their investment decisions okay thank you right, thank you did you want to come back in Jimmy Green yeah. just very briefly thank you it's following on from uh, Kenneth Gibson's line of questionings. Um, given that the uh, First Minister has stated uh, in recent days and weeks that every uh, government minister and, and directorate will be reviewing their policies in light of the declared uh, emergency on climate change, uh, in terms of your portfolio, uh, do you think that will alter uh, the amount of resource uh, or uh, indeed uh, work that goes into uh, your department's work in the energy sector, specifically in carbon energy. You mentioned your office in Houston supporting the oil and gas sector. I mean, is there any potential that, that you may reduce, indeed, uh, any of this activity in light of uh, recent movements? key issue there is around about the transition. Um, and the renewable sector uh, is where, in terms of technology, Scotland is world leading. Um, and that's recognised, and I, I see that um, when, when I visit the international markets, the high esteem that the Scottish renewables sector is held in and the technology that we, we have in place and are rapidly developing. So I think it's about how rapidly we, we manage that transition um, and we've got uh, we've got tremendous scope there um, clearly the stats in terms of how much renewable energy we're generating in Scotland continue to outpace all the, the estimates and the, the forecasts um, but when I was again met with Equinor in, uh, in Oslo recently and they have have uh, chosen Scotland to invest in the first, uh, the world's first uh, commercial offshore floating wind farm, um, which is um, a real step change in the technology. And right across all of the renewable opportunities, Scotland is well placed. And I think in the innovation space I'm responsible for, and in the trade space I'm responsible for, um, the, the more that we can do to generate innovation in the renewable sector, um, to accelerate that transition, I think, is the biggest single contribution that uh, that my department can make. So if a, uh, a traditional carbon energy company approached you or any of your uh, agencies for assistance, you would uh, say, no thanks, we're, we're focusing on the environmentally friendly energy at the moment? Well, there's processes in place at the moment and in, 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 in long-standing arrangement with, with businesses and uh, across all sectors that we continue to support. The point I made is about the transition. So it's not a, a cliff edge, it is a transition and it's accelerating that transition so that the uh, the renewable technologies are uh, are, are, are moved uh, uh, even further ahead than they already are. And uh, um, I mentioned Equinor, but uh, the, the businesses that are in that sector understand very well that transition is hugely important. Um, I was at the Oil and Gas Technology Centre a few weeks back in Aberdeen, and despite its name, a huge amount of what they do is also renewables focused, um, and that's continuing to increase. So it's something that the sector understands, it's something that we understand, and as I say, it's all about uh, driving the innovation, be it in wind, be it in hydrogen, be it in adoption of, uh, of electric vehicles and so on and so forth, heat solutions, etc., to accelerate that uh, that trend. Thank you. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, it might be too early to say, or it might be decisions that will be kept behind closed doors, but I think we have a understanding of where Scotland might see opportunities, whether that's in specific uh, market access or... Um, access to services or procurement, so we can see where the positives are, but alongside that there would be an expectation of um, compromises and what we are prepared to trade off in exchange for those benefits. Um, and uh, Mr Mc, uh, Gibson mentioned um, American chicken, so loosening regulatory standards as one area uh, could be about tariff spikes on certain products. Um, are you able to 
say where you think Scotland might be looking to what we would offer in exchange for some of the things that we're looking for? Well, I, I think it's a very valid point and I'm glad you raised it because it's something we haven't really touched on. We, we've tended to focus on the uh, impact on producers um, and consumers, but the, uh, the the regulatory aspects, be that environment, be it workers' rights, be it um, food uh, standards, uh, animal welfare, etc. There's a whole range of, uh, of other aspects there that are hugely important in the Scottish context. Uh, many of them are devolved and really talks to the points that we make that trade deals these days are uh, are complex and not just about selling widgets back and forward. They're, 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 they're much, uh, much wider impacts than that and many of those impact on, on devolved um, uh, aspects, which is why it's so important that the Scottish Government and other devolved administrations are involved in that process right through the, the, the trade negotiations. Um, so, uh, and of course, access to um, our health service is something that's been, been talked about as, uh, as well. So, uh, in all of those, the, the Scottish Government's position that we would want to maintain um, the, the standards we have and that uh, the, uh, we, we would be very um, clearly opposed to anything that, uh, for example, opened up our, our NHS or any other aspect of our public sector to, um, to unwanted uh, um, um, uh, inputs from... Uh, from businesses that might want to seek to to, to privatise or, or otherwise uh, challenge some of those uh, some of those services, so that's something we're very strong on, and that's something that we would be putting on the table as part of of trade negotiations, depending on how they unfolded going forward. So it could be suggested that's quite a protectionist approach. Um, if we're looking at it's not. A, I'm saying it could be suggested. Um, if we're looking at trade deals with the US, who are seen as quite an aggressive negotiator. Um, do you think it is possible for Scotland and the UK to get deals? It might not be this, the morning to talk about where we would make concessions, but there is a trade-off involved in, in making those deals. And do you think the UK is in a position that they um, understand the rules of the game when it comes to international trade? Well, I, again, talking back to the fact that there's a lack of uh, experience um, in those trade negotiations, then clearly that is a, that is a, that, that's potentially a challenge. Um, and um, referring back to the comments that were made about the, the, the Canada-EU deal, um, not all trade deals necessarily are good trade deals. If you negotiate a bad trade deal, you end up in a worse place than, than, than where you started. So it's, um, it's very important to understand what it is you're going to gain and what it is you're potentially going to lose as part of that process and go into that with your eyes open. So um, the, uh, the, the be-all and end-all isn't, to negotiate trade deals if there are trade deals that don't don't help uh, you deliver what you're trying to achieve, be that for your economy or for your wider wider societal interests. Um, and I think it's all about what happens in the negotiation and therefore it's very important for Scottish interests where we've perhaps got a different perspective on some of those aspects and the, the rest of the UK might have that they are um, to the fore um, in terms of our input to any UK negotiating position in any of these deals. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister, you, you mentioned the NHS, um, which is interesting because when we were um, taking evidence from international trade experts a few weeks back, um, and we were talking about the importance of, as we talked about earlier, setting your red lines, your negotiating position at a very early stage, and I pointed out to them that the Scottish NHS was independent of the UK NHS, and there had been concerns publicly aired that the Scottish NHS could be opened up to uh, more marketisation as a result of international uh, trade agreements and these international experts said it was actually possible to specify at the very beginning uh, before the negotiations began that the Scottish NHS should be treated separately um, because it wasn't marketised in the same way as um, the English NHS. Is that something that the Scottish Government is aware of and are you looking into the possibility of doing that? I'm thinking in particularly in the context of American trade deal. Yes and absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Are you able to give us any more detail? I mean, it's, it's, it's something, of, of course, we're aware of it. Yeah. Um, it's something that um, I, I'm glad we've got the opportunity to, 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 to raise here this morning. Um, and it's something that is very much to the, the fore of our, our thinking 
uh, if and when we get to the stage of um, making our inputs to any UK UK trade negotiations. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and the committee is also aware that the issues of state aid and geographical indicators are ongoing areas of disagreement between the Scottish and the UK governments. The UK government believes that they are reserved, although it's not specified as reserved in the Scotland Act. I mean, what do you consider to be the implications um, of that position for the devolution settlement? Well, on state, I'll let Ruben talk to this in a minute as well because it gets a bit more technical. But on state aid, initially, uh, the, um, the, the the issue there um, isn't necessarily that state aid would become freed up when you can do what you like. Because if you're going to trade negotiation with partners, and the EU is the obvious one, but others as well, then the, the, the level playing field concept applies. And um, if uh, we were having a trade deal with somebody and, and our intent was that we would subsidise business to then go and export to them, they would kind of feel that that would be unfair and would be part of the, 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 the trade deal negotiation. And I think, I think it's fair to say, and Ruben will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the UK government has, has kind of stated that uh, state aid w rules would, would, would broadly stay the same as that at the moment going forward. Um, so I think it's it's one of these areas where um, there is a, a, a disagreement about the wording of the, the Devolution Act and exactly where the responsibility lies, but I don't think in the immediate term it would necessarily lead to any different approaches. Um, geographic indications is um, is a bit more complex, but I think I'll let Ruben maybe talk to, to both of those. So uh, I agree uh, with what the minister said out there. The the important uh, sort of uh, the important thing here for us is that it shows the close alignment, perhaps between Scotland and the the EU. So they're both the state aid principles and the geographical indicators are very important to the EU and its way of doing business and its trade and its internal market. Uh, and Scotland, uh, the Scottish government's position is, al is aligned with seeing the importance of both of those. So I think um, without wanting to perhaps segue into a long uh, debate around the devolved uh, aspects of, of uh, the Devolution Act and whether uh, geographical indicators and um, state aid are devolved or reserved, uh, then the, the the important bit is that they are in, uh, very important to Scotland in terms of our trading relationship with the world and that our alignment with the EU's position on seeing the state aid uh, principles as, as a sensible approach uh, and seeing geographical indicators as an important part of preserving and protecting uh, Scottish brands and Europe, the EU sees its important part of protecting EU brands, um, uh, uh, is, is kind of a, a strong, there's a strong sense of alignment there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've had a very wide-ranging um, discussion today, so thank you very much for that. Uh, we're slightly ahead of time, uh, but we're able to move into private session now. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence to thank us you today. Very much.